And so it was quite astounding that they came out and labeled night work as a carcinogen. Did any, does anybody here, um, did you know John O'Donohue? Or have you read any of his books? He's quite an extraordinary man who died uh, last year, and so there's a tribute to him in it. He was a poet, philosopher, theologian, ex-priest, and soul friend who adored awakenings and dawns. And I talk about the many rituals of dawn, including all of those around the world that feature the colors of sunrise such as cardinals donning red robes, women applying red lipstick, workmen planting red stop signs, and why duels are scheduled for dawn. It's so that the participants will miss. You know, it's understood that they're, if they're up all night, as they're bound to be, worried, <laughs> sick, that come dawn, they're going to be nervous wrecks anyway. It's going to be misty or foggy. There they're going to stand with their pistols, and they're going to turn away from each other and pace away, and then swivel around fast, get disoriented in the process, in the low light, and miss, which was the whole point. So the duels were always at dawn. Uh, why rabbits come to be associated with Easter dawn? There's a long tradition of that. There are lots of things of that sort. I love gathering marbles and sharing them and in the process coming to a fresh gratitude for the diversity of creation and all the marvelous possibilities wrapped up in dawn. So for me, the book is really a series of small astonishments and secular hallelujahs, a blend of the poetic, scientific, medical, spiritual, and commonplace, a rediscovery of dawn. I hope that when readers set the book down that they'll see the world just a little bit differently understand humans just a tiny bit more and find it easier to appreciate some of nature's everyday miracles. Thank you. Well, if you have any questions, I'll try to answer them. Yes? Do you think your personal consciousness is She was asking if I think my personal consciousness is different at dawn, and I do. I think that there is that liminal time when you're not totally awake yet, and all of the worries and the burdens of the world haven't quite settled on your shoulders. You know, that's going to happen, but you're in this dreamy state, almost like a twilight sleep time. And I think that one is very receptive then to some of the more profound thoughts and feelings. You know, because you have um, um, some levels of emotion that you normally maybe mask or hide or put on the shelf or something like that else when in the day that you can't quite put aside <coughs> also. So I think my consciousness is different. And um, as I said at one point, because my husband was ill and I desperately needed some enriching way to transcend, Dawn was very important for me because after then, I would be going off to the hospital for the day where I'd have to be his advocate and comfort and lots of other things. So this was a private time for me, but it was also timeless time for me in which I was just in the presence of what was eternal. Yeah. Yes? Have there been any studies on the intelligence of stones that you know of? I I know. It's really quite extraordinary. I didn't know about starlings either, and I didn't even know that I had this incredibly smart starling in my neighborhood wow. until I started looking into this. And now, Killicky sends out regular emails with just uh, the long uh, note-takings that she's got of what the starling has said. And in the book, I, I listed at quite greater length. But it's absolutely amazing what the bird picks up pieces together and kind of knows how to give, you know, accept, respond in kind of simple conversations because starlings learn from adult starlings and they imprint on adult starlings and they speak starling talk. But when they're with humans, they want to do the same thing and they speak human talk to the best of their abilities. They have very tiny brains, but so do parrots. And we know that parrots can do a certain amount of abstract thinking. There's been tons of studies of parrots. Not quite as much of starlings. I think um, 
really, I think they're much more interesting. They do more complicated um, language. How in that tiny little brain, I don't know. Any, any other questions? Yeah? Uh-huh. Do you know anything about dragonflies? Do I know anything about dragonflies? The reason why I'm asking is yes. because two times in my life I've seen two different, I think they were different dragonflies on different days, playing with my son. Like, you know, he's, he was running and then this dragonfly would come and, you know, look at him and then run around and then he'd go and my son would chase him and then my son would run back and he'd chase him and this would go on for 10 or 15 minutes. I don't know about dragonflies, but it doesn't surprise me because so many other animals play in the way that humans play. Um, crows, for example. I've seen crows um, like drop a paper cup and then get on it, kind of log roll it down the hill or, or um, be on a telephone wire and drop a twig and then dash down and try to catch it and stuff. They play different games. And I was um, swimming in the Bahamas, a kind of shallow bank there, once some years ago when a wonderful um, group of dolphins showed up. And they came to play with humans. You know, it was clear that humans were their bathtub toys. <laughs> <laughs> and it, it was absolutely clear that they were playing because, for example, one came up to me and it went very slowly, which is not easy for a dolphin and in a circle, you know, and got me to circle around, and then it started going faster and faster and faster, and I was following it as fast as I could, and then just peeled off and watched, <laughs> you know? Um, and on another occasion, um, I had uh, my hair braided, and I had a ribbon in the back, and so I dropped it to see, and let it fall to the bottom to see what the dolphin would do, and uh, the dolphin picked it up and brought it back up and dropped it for me, and we just did this for a while, um, and then a few of them were in formation, and they zoomed up, they waited for humans to get in with them, you know, and they just went along very slowly and stuff. Um, they were paying a lot of attention, echolocating the tummy of a woman who was pregnant, and I assume they could tell. It was amazing how many games they, they just wanted to play. One of them, um, we were snorkeling, and I went down to the bottom, and one of them came up, and it just surfaced with me slowly, eye to eye. I, I don't imagine the dolphins are easily bored, but as I say, we were bathtub toys for them. I've seen lots of animals play, you know, and um, also experience other emotions um, that we tend to cherish as being mainly human, you know, like empathy, for example. And you, yet you see a lot of this, too. Yes? Are you writing any poetry? I am writing some poetry. I'm always writing some poetry. <laughs> yes, in between. Yes, um, I love writing prose, and I probably write more prose than I do anything else these days. But the source of my creativity really is as a poet. I love that more than anything. You know, I think um, there's something about trying to capture part of life with the rigorous pungency of uh, a phrase or um, an image that is satisfying for me in a way that nothing else is. And so I try to do that in the prose books too, but there's, there's something fun about writing poetry. Yeah. And thank you for asking about that. <laughs> well, if you have no other questions, I thank you. Please come up and say hello. Thank you.